I'm going to channel my inner Bill Nye, the science guy. I hope you brought your reading glasses because we're going to read tonight. I look at a few things. Uh, I can't. They're, they're just uh, reading glasses. So if I look up, everything goes crazy. So I don't wear them very often. One day I'll definitely need them more often. <laughs> um, if you could turn to Joshua chapter two, please. Um, so tonight, um, one of my favorite scriptures is in Hebrews and I'll just read a portion of it. Um, it's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it says, uh, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching and with the worldly events in the news, um, we can definitely wonder if what's happening overseas in Israel right now is maybe one of those final stepping stones to the Lord's return, but all of these are signs for us that the Lord is returning and we do not need to be confounded or caught up in that. Um, it's a tragedy. It's terrible. People do people, mankind does evil things every day in the world. And so, uh, and we look towards our wonderful savior who loves us very much. who died on the cross for us. And we look forward to that day when he comes back and the word of God talks about, uh, signs that would be of his imminent return and wars and rumors of wars is one of them. So with that said, um, all about exhorting one another. And so, um, man, I, I, I honestly really struggled with this talk. So I hope it comes out really well. I mean, usually when I'm, um, oh my goodness, struggling in a stopwatch. Usually when I go through the process of coming up with an idea, I have some prayer. The Lord gives me an idea and it starts to grow from there and put the pieces together, almost like a puzzle. And, I got about two thirds the way through and man, the puzzle just wasn't having a completion and start again, try it again, have some prayer, got about two thirds the way through and wasn't getting it. And this happened for quite a while. And, and, uh, Ethan asked me, he goes, well, how long do you usually like? And I said, I like about 10 days. <laughs> it gives me a time to really, you know, think about what God's got going on and, and, and pray about some things and, and the process come. That's for me. Well, um, Monday, I was just like writer's block, I guess. <laughs> I was just praying like, okay, Lord, I, I need an idea. So you are in Joshua um, in chapter two and talking about exhortation um, really brought to mind. We got an echo, 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 echo. Shame on you. Um, anyway, um, that's annoying. Praise the Lord. Uh, so I was thinking about all of the uh, i don't know how how people would term hebrews 11 um whether you know some people call it the hall of faith um but there's many wonderful examples in in the word of god of uh, men and women of faith who did some some very mighty things and so um looking at the women and men of faith in hebrews 11 um i chose a few out and added a couple more and um so i want to look at some of the things that they did, some of their attitudes, some of the things that they endured, and um, how their faith, some of the characteristics of their faith. So we're in Joshua chapter two. And um, if you don't have your reading glasses on, put them on now, because we're gonna read a bit. And in chapter one, uh, chapter two, verse one, it says, and Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab saying, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house for they be come to search out all the country. So Rahab being one of the women in chapter 11 of Hebrews, um, being a harlot, I, I thought of her position in society probably was not very esteemed, you know, probably the, the type of person that people wouldn't hold the door open for maybe, um, wouldn't treat her with respect, wouldn't, she was probably a, a, a lower step in society as it were. And so here the king comes demanding that she turns over these two spies. And, you know, if you can imagine a king with authority, pomp, presence, probably had men come and saying, look, we're not asking if you could do this. He's telling her, hand over the spies. And I wondered, 
if at first she knows the stories that she's hearing, and we're going to read in a minute, but she misdirects the king. And I wonder if maybe hoping for something better in her life, wanting something better, having her stature in society, hearing of wonderful things coming that God is working with some people, right? And maybe she said, you know, you guys aren't very nice and I don't want to help you. <laughs> and so uh, we'll pick it up. We'll keep going. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out whither the men went, I what, what not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. So she throws a smoke screen. She says, go after them. You might catch them. They, they were here, but they left. I don't have no part of them, right? But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And I wondered how many stalks had to be laid upon them to hide them. How comfortable or uncomfortable might that have been to like, hey, hey, don't sneeze. <laughs> I know your nose is itching. Don't scratch it. You're going to make the, flox, the flax rustle. You know, these men are hiding up there. Was it a, a warm day and these flax are laid upon them enough to hide them? Okay. And the men pursued after them, you know, taking Rahab's initiative that she'd given them and, and they took off on the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And it continued in verse eight, said, and before she, before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. So before she took them off the roof and removed the flax and helped them out. And she said unto them, and this is, this is a pretty powerful moment. I mean, you got to understand she's a, she's not in a high stature and, and she's probably living a very meager lifestyle. And she's already heard the rumors of the children of Israel coming. Okay. I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So she's not an Israelite. She's a, a lady of Jericho. And she hears these, these mighty testimonies coming forth that there's a children coming forth that God has dried up the waters of a Red Sea that they were able to cross, that God has blessed their hand in battle and overtaken the Amorites, two kingdoms, okay? So, so she's hearing it and all the men's heart did faint in Jericho. They were afraid of this people that were coming and she believes in God. And that's the beginning of her testimony to us is she believes in God. She believes that God, God's people are coming, okay? Where do we get to? Chapter 2, verse 12, right? Yes. Okay. Now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. And so the, ne the next thing I thought is like, here she is, Rahab, probably again of a lower statue or state in the, in the town. She could have asked the king for a ransom, you know, or a bounty or say, hey, um, is there a bounty? She could have made some kind of financial gain from it. She could have looked to the two, two spies and said, well, hey, you know, I, you know, if you're going to come in and wipe these people out, can I have the corner condo up there that's got an overlook of the park and the, and the oasis down below and the palm trees because I'm, I'm over here in the not so good side of town. The one thing that she desired was for her family to be saved. She believed the children of God were coming and she wanted to be saved. Okay. The, the steps of faith. And I think we're going to be in 13. And that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours, if ye utter not this business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. 
Then she let them down by a cord. And, and I'm just going to stop there because we're going to run out of time tonight um, very easily. I got like 50,000 scriptures, trust me. Um, no, literally, probably about that many. Um, let's go to uh, Genesis 22. So you can see that that the big thing with with Rahab being remembered in that hall of faith, I guess you'd say in chapter 11 of Hebrews, where it's talking about faith, men and women of faith. She believed in God. She believed that God was blessing this people that were coming towards her. And her whole desire was to be saved. Her whole desire was for her and her family to be saved. So the beginning of faith, just a, an attribute. Um, and another note I made was, was she was humble in asking them. Again, she could have demanded a, a, a ransom or a bounty. She could have demanded anything. Come up, like I'm saving your lives. I mean, we we whack you. Maybe your people go right around us. Um, you know, it's like if none of the spies go back, maybe they divert. They had walls in Jericho. We all know the story of Jericho and the walls coming down, right? And so things could have worked much differently, but because of Rahab and her faith and and her humble desire. Uh, to seek them for for salvation, you know, it's really those attributes of of belief and faith. So uh, Genesis 22, did I say 22 yet? Genesis 22. I'm watching the clock. We're going to move here tonight. About as fast as Bobby's clapping up on some of these songs. God. Stay with the brother. I, I even thought just to write down just the, the chapters I'm going to go to, and I go, I don't even know if I could stay with myself at that pace. So, um, the next person I want to talk to, and, and uh, we last night we had a great prayer night uh, gathering. It's always good to come together with the saints and pray and uh, put petitions to him, um, because when you see God answer, you, you, you just know that he's alive and well. It just affirms uh, God's power for us. Um, and last night we're, uh, we heard a good, a good testimony by our brother Bobby of because of the world events, um, it opened him a door up for him to witness. And we hope and pray that the young man, or I think young, He's nodding. So yes, we hope and pray the man um, sees that God is calling and answers. Um, but one of the things Bobby started talking about was Abraham. And I was like, that, so we're going to look at Abraham right now in chapter 22. And I was just biting my tongue not to not to chime in last night with the testimony because it was really good. But man, if I would have had a cup of coffee, you guys would really be hurting. Um, so we'll get moving. Chapter 22 of Genesis and verse 1. Um, talking about Abraham. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. Okay, er, let's stop right there. Abraham is considered a friend of God. Abraham has another, uh, a well known past history of great testimony of faith in God. And he's in that hall of faith, as we would say. Um, his first answer is, here I am. You know, it's like, Lord, you're calling me. Here I am. And he answers. And so it's like, not like, I'm, I'm busy right now. Give me five seconds. Let me, you know, as the phone's ringing, Abraham picks it up. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I'll tell of thee. And we, we all are probably pretty familiar with the how uh, Sarah laughed and Abraham, they were just like, you know, in my old age, we're going to have kids. And I mean, come on, you know, and, and you really start, you can think about things naturally. And they went through their share of trials and tribulations to, to get where they were at this point. And now God is saying, take your son and sacrifice him. And for me in the natural, I was thinking, man, that would be tough. That would be really tough to have that kind of faith to, uh, as we read in verse six, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Okay. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they won't, both of them went together. So here's this wonderful promise God's given unto them. They've had this child old of age. They're seeing God is saying, here's a blessing, a child. Okay. The promises of, of the, the, the blessings coming through his seed. And now God is saying, come and sacrifice your child. And, and he puts the wood on on Isaac, and I mean, me, I'd be like a wreck. I'd be a complete wreck. But again, we're talking about about a man of faith, and what we can get from him. Okay, what we can glean from that. Continuing on, and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, "My father," and he said, "Here am I." He goes my son, and he said, "Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" I mean, you couldn't even sneak one by the kid, right? It's like, you know, Abraham's like, well, let's just keep going. 
And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went, both of them together. And I've always loved that scripture. It's a reference to Jesus Christ, a prophecy for Jesus Christ, God providing himself a sacrifice for us. Okay. And so if we start to see the mindset of Abraham. He's gone through tribulations. He's gone through trials. He's gotten to the point where in his walk with God, God's saying to do something. He's answering. You don't hear him like maybe me crying about it or questioning or, or like, wait, 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 Lord, are you thinking about this? Cause you said the blessings. Now we're going to go sacrifice my son. He's like, okay, well, there's the wood on Isaac and we're going up and Isaac's asking. And he says, no, God will provide himself a sacrifice, right? Start to see that faith of Abraham starting to click into place. And they came to the place, continue on in nine, which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wooden order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. I'm thinking, okay, they probably built the altar with rocks and wood. And how much time did he have to spend preparing that altar? I'm sure he didn't just like throw some cobblestones together and say good enough because God likes things done decently in order. So he probably was pretty meticulous in doing it. And, and I'm thinking all this time, he's not complaining. He's not, he's not saying, Lord, okay, please, is there another way? He's saying, okay, we're building the altar. And he binds his son to lay him upon the altar, right? Grabs his knife. Verse 11, and the angel of the Lord called out to him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And how does he answer? And he said, here am I, right? You got to love it. It's just beautiful. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. Seest that thou hast not seen, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. And that was why I requested that song tonight, because he is our provider. All the people said, amen, that we can truly trust in every situation that we're going through with him, that we can truly rely on him. We can hold on to him that he's not trying to hurt us. He's not putting us in a harmful situation, a harmful way. He's got our every good intention in his mind for us. Okay. Um, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, and it's still uh, remembered that way. So we'll continue to bounce on because I'm going to run out of time. I'm probably already close to it. Um, so turn to numbers. I got a little honorable mention. Uh, for Joshua and Caleb. I'm going to talk about them a little bit. Um, Abraham trusted. He feared in the Lord. And we know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it wasn't, it wasn't a fear like, like God's going to come and beat him. It's like, if I don't answer the call, what's going to happen is worse. What's going to happen is worse. What the, what the world has out there for us, if we don't answer the call, is much worse. And sometimes we may think it's a tough situation. Um, I, really, I really enjoyed Cass's testimony on Sunday. If you're online and you haven't, haven't seen it, um, uh, dig it out and uh, check it out. She gave a beautiful testimony of schooling and, and being a young mom and, and how the Lord provided and made a way for her. Um, so uh, give her a text and have her share it with you. It's very powerful. Um, so Joshua and Caleb. And this is um, spying out the land in Numbers. Um, we've got a verse 17. Now, this is before the children are going to look at the promised land of Canaan, all right? This is before. This is, you know, the spies that came into Jericho, the children of Israel would finally, I'm a little back to front, but the children of Israel would finally come around to saying, hey, we're tired of wandering in the desert. Please, Lord, send us home. And they were going to the promised land in in um, with Rahab in Jericho. Now, this is this is before. And in verse 17 of Numbers 13, did I get you there yet? Numbers 13, verse 17. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said unto them, get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or strongholds. So, I mean, just simply, we're going to go take the promised land at this point, go check it out, see what's what we got going on over there. 
Verse 20, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So it was a simple instruction, go check it out and see what God's got in store for us. You know, they're, they've, they've seen the miracles of going to the Red Sea. They've seen the, the pillar of cloud during the day, the pillar of fire at night. They, they see the manna they've been eating and God's providing for them. I mean, mighty, mighty signs, wonders, and miracles that God's doing. And, and now he's saying, go into the promised land. So now we're going to get into where they went. Oops. So they went up and they searched from the land from wilderness in 21 of Zin and Rehob as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and they came unto Hebron. Hebron were... Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, Hebron was built seven years before in Zon in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eskel, Eshkel, Eshkel, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. So these two... When, I mean, I just can't imagine a cluster of grapes so big that you would need to now get a staff so you could carry it between two grown men. And if these guys are, are the spies, they're probably pretty fit and they're living off the land and they're knowing how to take care of themselves or they're not like me with a little extra around the midriff and sitting on the couch. You know, they're probably very fit men, but they had to get a staff between to carry it and some pomegranates and figs. And the place was called the Brook Eshkel because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching into the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Gadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. That's all we need to hear, right? That's all we need to know. God has promised to give us wonderful things in our life, promised to take care of us, promised to provide for us, promised to fill us with joy. That's all we need to know. We can go watch the news. We can go dig into, I was telling, I was, me and Tam, we were joking. And, and I said, yeah, I can't even watch sports anymore because someone loses. You know, usually it's my team. She goes, well, my team's winning. So, um, but you know, the, the world is full of bad news. But in the Lord, it's full of good news, praiseworthy, positive, uplifting stuff, stuff that empowers us and, and puts the smiles on our faces, right? Jesus Christ does that for us. But the people, and we'll continue on, and just, this is where the 40 years of wandering came from. 40 years, okay? You know, in, in Philippians it says, whatever things are just and pure and holy and praiseworthy and have virtue, think on these things. Because we know that God is an, an author of good things in our life. He's creating a good work. Think on these things, right? 40 years versus, I, I read a little something and, and it could be true. Um, they could have taken the promised land in 11 days. And I don't know. I mean, I've had some tough 11 days in my life, but I think 40 years of wandering and being proven, you know, having to prove your faith that you love the Lord. And, and a lot of those people didn't make it. A lot didn't make it. And it made me think, like, here they're set up, and, and maybe the Smiths one morning, you know, it's like, ah, we're feeling a little little gimpy. We're not going to follow. We'll catch up because there's this big path of people leading Moses. Just go forward. We'll catch up. Never saw the Smiths again. You know, the Joneses, they saw that beautiful oasis out there. It was the end of a hot day, and they said, let's go find that oasis. Let these people go. I mean, it's like, it's been 14 years. Let them wander. Let's go over there. The oasis was Mirage. Never heard of them again. And you don't hear about them because they, they didn't make it. But we'll continue on. I think we're in verse 28. So here comes the bad report. Okay. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled. All right, Jericho, heard about that one? Very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land to the, the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Okay? So when Brother Josh gets up there and says, let us go up at once, right? 
and possess it, or Bobby, or Tammy, or any one of us says, remember the promises. That's what we need to know. Who cares about the 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 tights, <laughs> Hittites, Jebusites, Malachites, so all those guys? It's, you know, there's always going to be, you know, the devil in our ear saying, "You can't do it. You can't make it. You're not you're not strong enough. You're not good enough." Or remember that little sin last week, Craig? You ain't going to make it now. Nope. As far away from the east as the west is, so our sins have been removed, and the Lord is going to bless us. We are His people. All well, the people said, amen. So, and Caleb stilled the people with those words. He stilled the people before Moses and he said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. The power that created the, the heavens and the earth dwells within us. That power is in us right now that has created the heavens and the earth, you know, and so well able to possess this. Whatever the thing is, Tammy's beautiful testimony tonight. I really just want to talk to my granddaughter, Lord. Can you make a way? Sure, let me do that for you. Not only once, but I'll give you twice. Twice. I thought that's beautiful. Thanks, the Lord. So, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report and blah, 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 blah. We'll leave it at that with those guys. 11 days versus 40 years. Just think about that. And I, I don't know what, how this guy was thinking, you know, 11 days of the conquest and the fighting, because then it wasn't seven days around Jericho. So that'd be four days to get out there and do some things. But I think he was saying if you kind of walked the promised land that the children of Israel possessed, it would take you 11 days to do it. And it probably would have been that easy for them if they would have went when God said. Okay, so uh, flip over to Joshua. We are running out of time. Yeah, we're getting, getting close. Um, Joshua 14, verses 6. Um, I'm going to skip through. This is this is Caleb coming back 45 years later after they finally get into the promised land. And he just, he recounts his testimony. In verse 8, he says, But I wholly followed the Lord my God. I wholly followed the Lord my God. And he was just asking for the inheritance that was his, right? And in verse 9 again, Because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now the Lord, behold, in verse 10, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these 40 and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old, 85. And yet, I am as strong, and I, I want to say in parentheses, in faith, this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. And he goes on to say, now give me my, my inheritance. And so then he, Joshua blessed him, gave him his inheritance. Um, jump over to Hebrews 11. So th those three instances, as I'm running out of time here, trusted and obeyed, right? Abraham, a friend of God, believed and was humble, Rahab, wholly followed after the Lord, Joshua and Caleb, right? Wonderful attributes for their testimony of faith and what considers, you know, got them into, you know, Hebrews 11, where we can read about them. And verse one, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the ev evidence of things not seen. You know, Rahab simply had faith that the stories she was hearing were true, that there was a God that was working in a group of people and that he was giving them a land. And it appealed to her. She believed those stories. She she believed and hoped in something better, hoped in something better. Um, in verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay? Believe. We saw Rahab again. She believed in the message she was hearing. She believed in it. You know, and we know John 3, 16 is a wonderful scripture. The, those who believe, right, trust, obey, adhere to God's word, and diligently seek him, diligently, just like Joshua and Caleb. Uh, jump down to verse 13. We're, we're winding down. I told you I had about 50,000 scriptures. Maybe I'm at 47,000, but close. Hebrews 11, verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
<laughs> that was tough. I want extra credit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Beautiful, beautiful child. Okay. These all were persuaded and embraced and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims, right? For they that they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country very similar to us we seek a promised land that god has told us of a new heavens and a new earth jesus is now preparing a mansion for us he says i go to way prepare a place for you right even now in verse 14 and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had the opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country that is a heavenly wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he hath prepared for them a city yeah, you know, just we can truly just rejoice. You, if you step out in faith and you're listening to the good, positive things, and you're and you're following that bright path by God's word that He's laying out for you, there is a city that's waiting for us. Okay, verse thirty nine. We'll close it out here. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. I'm like, whoa, man! Abraham came short. Moses didn't get in. Joshua and Caleb, Rahab, like, oh man, they didn't. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. So because of the things that they did, God showed us what faith is, what qualities it takes, what, what the characteristics of the faith that we need to let that grow inside of us, okay? I, I like the way uh, the Amplified brings out verse 40 and... Uh, Verse 48 in the Amplified says, because God had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us. And we know that's the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, amen. He had, he had that wonderful salvation in mind for us. So that these heroes and heroines of faith, I'm like, whoa, that's powerful. Heroes and heroines of faith. You think of the things, I mean, like, the Rahab had to endure, like, hey, hang that little red scarlet cord from your window, and if everybody stays in your house, you'll be safe. You know, and, and the battle's going on, they probably heard it. You know, the children of Israel have come, the walls are crumbling and crashing down. You know, heroes and heroines of faith. Joshua and Caleb, 40 years, my goodness, wandering in, you know, wanderings, like, oh my goodness, are we ever going to get there, Lord? No, they hung on to the promise. They wholly followed the Lord. They wholly followed after him heroes and heroines of faith should not come to perfection apart from us before we could join them so it's a complete package you know faith upon faith it's a complete package we can see the wonderful things that they endured we can draw strength from them and we can definitely see the path the lord's laid out for us all the people said with that we'll turn over to our brother bobby i think we're gonna have a time of prayer now five minutes